What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Bassist educator author David C. Gross and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an artist. Revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. What happens? You're about to find out. It's another episode of Notes from an Artist. David, what a fascinating two-part conversation we are having with Matt Lavelle. Those of you in our audience, for our audience member, if you don't know Matt, he is a band leader, collaborator, horn player. Does he play David Flugelhorn, coronet, alto clarinet? He is a performing recording artist, and he's talking to us from his home in Philadelphia. Many interesting topics we discussed with Matt. Yes, indeed. We went from Ornette Coleman to the bass clarinet to the alto clarinet. And also, you don't want to forget that he is also a painter. He is a painter. He's an author. He is a podcast host, just like us. And he migrated to Philadelphia, actually, because he thought it was more affordable. But he learned otherwise when he got there. Yes, Pat's steaks are very, very expensive. Exactly. And the Phillies, well, they did... They did get to the World Series last year. He's going to talk about his work with Ornette and his harmelodic monk philosophy, which is very, very cool. So let's dive into part one of Matt Laval. And there's Matt. There's Matt Laval. Hey, guys. He looks just Hello. like he does on the interwebs. How you doing, Matt? I'm looking. I'm, I'm feeling good. Are you able to breathe? I, uh, well, you know, it's uh, it is. It's like kind of smoky outside, to be honest. Where Where exactly are you? David is in Connecticut. I'm in a place called Manhattan. Where are you? I'm in Philadelphia. Oh, okay. So uh, I guess you're a few miles away from us, and we're a few miles away from Canada. But what's going on, David? Is Canada on fire? I, I'm not aware of this. Yes, Canada has just. Decided to burn. It's just one of those things. They do this every now and then. They do it, uh, right? Okay. After the however, this comes. is one of the few times where it's actually bothering us. I'm two hours out of, I'm near the Berkshires. Okay? The sun's orange. It's like a bad science fiction movie. There's a real haze where you can't see the sky in, in, uh, in Philly, which is, it's more like New York, where you just can't see anything. It's just this haze. So that's kind of weird. Well, when did you make the move to Philadelphia? Uh, about a, very recently, about a year and a half, two years ago. Okay, because I remember back in the, I think it was the 90s or the double zeros when Brooklyn was getting really, really expensive. The advertising was from, and I guess it's from the real estate developers in Philly, come come to Soho, and meaning south of Houston, 90 minutes south of Houston is a place called Philadelphia. Is that a big transition for you? I really didn't think it was going to, going to be that big a deal. I kind of didn't take it nearly as uh, seriously as it actually turned out to be vastly different. It's it's only 90 minutes, really. So, you know, some people call Philly the fifth borough, and I was like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to be part of the New York scene. Right. But I'm going to be able to survive financially was the plan. And then uh, and what I came to uh, learn is that Philly is, even though it's very close, it is a very different place. How so? How so? Other than the Phillies and the Mets, I guess. I think uh, it's not the only uh, parts of America that I think have this kind of trade off. The money for rent or mortgages or whatever goes way down. Right. But everything else goes way up. And, and, mm. and I mean, like, in particular, violence. There are people getting shot. Young kids are shooting and, and, and uh, killing each other every day. I mean, when I was in New York, I mean, I was like 30 years in New York, and I was fairly insulated from that kind of thing. Yeah, I would I, say in the I, last 30 years, right, uh, under the, I guess, uh, uh, Bloomberg, Giuliani, the Mike Bloomfield administration, David, you remember that? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I got jumped once in Queens. I didn't uh, hear gunshots out my window on a on a fairly regular basis wow. <laughs> in, in New York. You know, it's not, you know, Philly's block to block. There are certain areas that are really bad and some that are not bad at all. I'm like right on the edge of a middle ground area. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in New York, man, I found I had all kinds of different living situations in New York. Okay. And 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 some were impossibly cool. I mean, I spent a while living in Hell's Kitchen at uh 10th Avenue and 50th Street. Prime location. It was 400 a month and I lived there for a while with uh, a roommate who had a a rent control place that he had been living in for a long time. Yeah, that's the yeah. secret. So it was a dream situation. I mean, I was like really admit I mean, and they say, you know, Hell's Kitchen is not Hell's Kitchen anymore. No, in name only. Right. 
In name only. So, uh, but that that area known as Hell's Kitchen. I think they're calling it Upper <laughs> Chelsea now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that and, and that meant that is so apt a description because that's exactly what it is. That that's what I think about when I when I'm there now. Is mm. Chelsea just went up by the time in my but my last uh, decade or so in NYC, I had to pay rent like most other people did. Right, and it was over the top for a really small space right and if you're an artist man you got a lot of really heavy feelings about what new york is has become and i still consider myself a part of it but i had to go adjacent just to be a part of it i had to leave it well it's it's interesting obviously i when you get outside of new york for a while you can observe it a little bit more clear i mean david obviously david made the uh, transition from the upper west side to connecticut well I, actually no i first was up um, in the nyack area okay. what were you in nyack man you know i went to high school in the nyack area oh okay yeah, Nyack was cool, man. And I lived on Main Street for a while. I mean, we're going we're going way back. We're going back to like uh, late eighties, early nineties. But- well, early nineties, I was in Piermont, and then um, I moved out of the city, moved to Piermont, and then I moved to Grandview. But when they started building the bridge, the only people that were really being inconvenienced were the people in Grandview because it was right River Road, right by the the bottom of the bridge. I just said the heck with this, and um, we moved to Connecticut. I, I've heard good things about Connecticut. This is cat uh, Mixer Sean, tenor player. Man, he loves Connecticut. His name is uh, Mixer Sean. He's a tenor player. I know. He's more like on the avant-garde side. Well, that's fine by me. And uh, <laughs> no harm got like You got like Joe Morris, right? And uh, I mean, Joe's a major, major guy. He's got a, like a there's like a scene up there that he curates. Right in the New Haven area by that Firehouse Twelve, right? Yeah, I think so. I, I haven't been a, I haven't been to it for a while, but I, I know he's up there. I've noticed other people leave New York. If you get to a certain place career-wise, you don't have to be there anymore. <laughs> right, and that's uh, that's certainly endemic of what's happening in the city now, of uh, people outside the music business. Now that everyone's working remote, that big money is leaving the city, and that's what the arts feeds off of, was Wall Street and, and the gentrification. My real beef is that New York would love to use the imagery of the jazz man. But they don't support the oh, jazz man. Yeah, there's the there's the wailing saxophone. You see like a New York uh, tourist thing. They'll always show some guy playing a sax. But then, right. And then, is that Giuseppe Logan? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or maybe, you know, and, and, and you know, Giuseppe was playing in, in Tompkins Square Park. He, he, he was playing on the outside of the street to survive. He wasn't getting support. That's 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 kind of like my. But New York has always been like that. I mean, it's, it's not anything that anybody doesn't know. Is that it's, New York could care with it? New York could care less whether you're there or whether you're not there. It's like yeah. it's gonna it's gonna be going down. And if you want to participate, that's on you. You know what I mean? <laughs> Well, I also think that it's not just New York. I think the arts are looked at differently in the U.S. than, let's say, you know, where where a Derek Bailey, Tony Oxley, or folks like that could survive very, very well in England because they were being supported. Where over here, you really got to suck dick to get a grant. Oh. You know, to be perfectly <laughs> honest, the Matt, that was the uh, that was the name of our show before we changed the notes. From our show. <laughs> suck dick to get a grant. So. <laughs> In case you're wondering what show you're on. Hey, you guys are cool, man. You got all glove, gloves are off, man. You know, like uh, we're, it's real, uh, real talk, you know, oh, yes. reality yeah, kind yeah. of stuff. That's uh, that's 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 beautiful, man. This is not anyway. NPR. But anyway, David, for our audience member, let's remind them who Matt is. He is a performing artist. He's a recording artist. He is a composer. He is a band leader, 12 Hours Orchestra. He is a collaborator. He's collaborated with Ornette Coleman, Henry Grimes, William Parker, among many other names of renown. David. Matt is also an author, just like you. Uh, New York City Subway Drama and Beyond in 2011, I believe that came out, right? And the Jazz Musician's Tarot Deck, which came out in 2013. So you're a very prolific person, and he's able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Tell me about this harmonic monk theory you put together. I I think David will be fascinated with this. Will you apply Ornette Coleman's philosophy to the music of uh, Thelonious Monk? Explain that to us in layman's terms. That was a record I did, I forget the year, maybe 
four or five years ago for Unseen Rain. And and what had happened was, well, I studied with Ornette for a while. What was that like? It wasn't a super long time. Some some people, somehow online, there's things out there that it was like I was, for decades, I was, it wasn't <laughs> a super long time. But it was life-changing and extremely intense for me because he was a very gentle, sensitive person in one way. But the way he communicates is really challenging in a one-on-one situation. He had has like his own dialect and so it's kind of like the way he plays okay the way he speaks the way he plays so it's like certain things mean other things than what you think or certain things might mean multiple other things and he's got like his own vocabulary and meanings for words that he uses that you might not know until you spend some time with them. And the subject matter is always very intense and personal. When it comes to actually harmonics itself, which is his philosophy that he created, is really the almost like a scientific word for what it is that he does. If you're in a music room, in his music room with him, he's soft-spoken, gentle kind of guy. But when it comes to music, he can be very aggressive, even confrontational. And I don't mean loud, like we were just talking about a few minutes ago, like real, real talk reality like about about what he thinks and uh especially in regards to your own playing it couldn't be more intense for me because i couldn't believe that i was even in the room with ornate coleman and then he drilled down and zeroed in on me <laughs> and started taking and started taking me apart musically at that time there was parts of my uh my own musical reality that i had not dealt with wasn't dealing with there are certain things that nobody will pull your coat on but even after i had just started to get to know him he put a mirror right up to my face and he was like this is what you're doing and then it's ornette coleman holding the mirror so i'm wow. like really changed my life in a in profound ways i always make a point that whenever people ask me about it i always give respect and gratitude to a, a photographer named john rogers who who brought me up there ornette had an open door policy that that's the crazy thing is if anybody was serious about learning harm melodics, he was down to go as far as you wanted and it, and it wasn't like you could make an appointment for a lesson at four o'clock and pay him a thousand dollars the way it was was he and he said why don't you come by and i was like well when he would say well if you come by and i'm here that means it's supposed to happen <laughs> That's how it worked. A couple of times I went and he was one time I went and he was actually going out the door to a tour in like South America or something. But sometimes he was there. <laughs> <laughs> so if he was, you could just spend the whole day and he would go as far as you wanted. And uh, it got to the point where he said, why don't you move in? Just like a uh, extreme mentor scenario wow. where you actually live with your uh, with your teacher. He said, quit all the, quit all your bands, quit every band that you're in, move in and we'll really get down. And that's when I blinked. That's when I got scared because it's almost overwhelming because I was like, at some, at somewhere in all of this is my own music. If I subscribe to to his teachings on that level, what is my music at that point? And uh, and I was also too scared to uh, move into his house because it would be so awkward. And my own financial situation was not good. It just seemed like it, you know. And as much as I love and idolize him, I couldn't cross that line and do that. And and he had a uh, he he had given me years, decades of stuff to work on to figure out what my own thing was. So decided to take the gift and work on it and work with it, and then check in with him from time to time. At that point. But it really changed everything, though. So you applied that philosophy to Thelonious Monk, the harmony, the rhythm of Thelonious Monk. Oh, yeah, Monk. thanks. <laughs> thanks for bringing me back to that. So I had, for a long time, I had always just had the idea to apply Ornette's concept to Monk's music, hence the title, uh, Harmonic Monk. I'm still uh, studying and learning about what it is that I did on that on that record and I've, I've learned a couple of things ornette is at the heart of ornette's practice is actually melody and same thing with monk the other thing about ornette that people don't realize which was pointed out to a friend of mine by a friend of mine to me is that for all the controversy about ornette back in the 60s and not not so much anymore but for all the controversy surrounding him nobody was saying that he couldn't swing <laughs> mm. right i mean you know his his earlier his early stuff is more 
coming out coming right out of bird the same thing with monk monk's thing is an extremely personal swing there's just the tempos and the melodies the vibe that monk has is always and from what i've learned about monk is he was all about the rhythm and the swing that's what he wanted from his bass and drums he wanted that that's what he wanted but i wanted to take it a step further and do some impossible instrumentation so our melodic monk is just me and vibes <laughs> because i also was like vibes and i wanted to focus on my alto clarinet because i wanted to venture into to this kind of thing using sounds that you also would not expect. Like there wasn't that much, there wasn't that much alto that happened in, in Monk's world aside from Gigi Grice. And uh, th there wasn't, it was mostly all about tenor. Mm -hmm. And then it's there, there, was, there was some trumpet stuff. Harmonic Monk worked out pretty good, but I was actually just scratching the surface on what it is that I was trying to do and I think it worked on that on on that record John Pietaro was on vibes mm -hmm. he's also a writer he's a he's a he's a writer and a musician mm -hmm. as but since you mentioned it in the next couple of weeks the sequel to Harmelodic Monk is coming out which is Harmelodic Duke <laughs> oh all right tell us about that project what I found out after I did monk well, the Harmelodic Monk thing is that I really wanted to take this approach and take a journey through jazz history almost kind of, almost almost like an attempt to unify jazz history it's not so much sending ornette backwards as really focusing focusing in on the commonalities between them in the end it's like I'm trying to prove that ornette is part of jazz history before he came around but but i'm not out to prove that but i but i am interested it's, a, it's in sort it. of an antecedent to the whole thing yeah I, I hear where you're going because really when you do think of monk and his music and ornate and his music you're right from all i've gathered about the harmalata concept it it really is melody first it's not like you can just play anything i mean that's that's just stupid so you can take that approach to melody and you can take it back to louis armstrong you can take it back to king oliver all the way back to Buddy Bolden, for that matter. Because ultimately, when you think about it, that it all comes from the blues anyway. That was the thing about Ornette's music, not to digress too much. If you listen to the early Ornette records, stuff on Contemporary, they were really blues records. Yeah. If you think about it, his solos were the blues. You definitely hear some direct correlations to... Uh, Robert Johnson, blind uh, Willie McTell. It, it, it was so obvious. And not that you're doing something odd, if you know what I mean, because it, it makes sense to do do. And it probably makes sense to do a lot of other folks, too. It'd probably be very, very cool. You know, um, Calvin's in Philly. Calvin Weston, who was in oh, the yeah. primetime band. Yeah. 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 I, I got to hook up with him. The, the Ornest crew is is really like a really something. The primetime crew is is they're they're kind of spread out, but they are a really special group of guys. <laughs> yeah. Man, and speaking guys, of man. musical guys, Matt, I want to talk to you. It's intrigued me from the beginning. How do you, from an embouchure point of view, going from trumpet, clarinet, alto clarinet, or bass clarinet, that's like they're different. <laughs> yeah. So how do you manage that? Well, there's a couple of things that I I wanted to try to do when I thought about the idea of even trying to do that. The whole thing started was because straight ahead jazz trumpet was not enough for me. And I also thought that I was never going to find really much room in a house with Lee Morgan and Freddie Hubbard and Miles and Clifford Brown, Thad Jones, these guys quintessential jazz trumpet playing. And when I was, you know, and that's what I was only doing in the in the in the early nineties was, you know, I was in my early twenties. I was trying to play straight ahead jazz trumpet like a zillion other guys. And what I realized is that most of us, we might have, we might be good at it. We might have our own thing to say, but it's hard to really definitively take territory in that realm when you're, for, for me personally, when you got Booker Little over here and Lee Morgan over here, you no, know, because true. their sounds and their skills are just so pure, you know, and I'm not saying that that kind of thing can't happen anymore. It was a different time when they were coming up, no matter how personal I could get my sound in my own language thing. If I just kept doing it straight ahead, I really didn't think I was going to end up getting very far. And I wasn't, you know, I was playing Smalls. Smalls is still around. I was going to the Smalls jam sessions. I was, you know, I, I was playing, but, you know, I had, I had some, I had some beautiful moments at jam sessions and stuff. I used to battle Roy Hargrove, uh, you know, play Cherokee at the Blue Note and stuff. It, it, it was fun. But for me, I didn't think I was ever going to get very far, but I also needed to get beyond the trumpet itself. I always wanted a very vocal kind of thing. 
Now, now, the trumpet players can get a vocal sound. Freddie Hubbard on flugelhorn, Miles, of course. But I thought there's other instruments where you could get more into the vocal sound. And this is one of the things that Ornette really encouraged was being as vocal as possible. As odd and as strange as they are, the alto and the bass clarinet, bass clarinet more in the upper register, they are, they are odd and strange instruments and sounds, really. Even, even if you look at them, they're like, what what happened yeah, to this yeah, action? Exactly. <laughs> they're strange looking, but but they allow me to get into this vocal kind of approach sound wise and then the, my, my whole thing has always been since the early 90s too is what is out there that hasn't been done what can i do there, there's so much that has been done in jazz and free jazz and improvisation across the board is there anything left for us to try ha okay i thought to myself well who has played trumpet and bass clarinet nobody as far as i know so i was like here's something i can do that no one has tried yet so that was the other reason i decided to try and do it now sorry to get away from your original question is i think the only reason i can do it is because it was only trumpet first mm. for, for more than 10 years at least 10 at least i'm not sure of the numbers but at least a decade it was just me and the trumpet. And I had my own journey with that. But armature wise, I had gotten enough training and practice enough that my trumpet armature was solid and it was built. And and one thing that's always been hard for brass reed doublers is for saxophone players that play trumpet. And a lot of those guys struggle with the trumpet because they've been saxophone players for years and years. Now, there's notable exceptions, of course. If you're a sax player and then you try to add trumpet, it's a lot more tricky. And, and the, the other thing is I methodically have to maintain my trumpet chops above everything else. My, my, my trumpet armature has has to be my number one priority every day. It's been that way for 30 years. So the, the first thing I do it when I when I get to music is maintain and develop my trumpet armature. Absolute first priority. If, if, if I don't do that, my trumpet is doomed and my whole system will collapse. And it's like that for all trumpet players. All, all trumpet players are resigned that they have to do this chops maintenance thing on a daily basis. It, maybe if it's only a half hour a day, whatever it is, you have to do it. Dizzy talked about that too. I've never stopped that, and but I introduced the. Uh, it was basically it was just bass clarinet for about another ten years. I introduced the bass clarinet, and it didn't interfere. I think because because the muscles and all of this stuff was was strong enough for the trumpet. The bass clarinet didn't interfere. I, I wasn't forced to choose or do anything really out of the ordinary. That being said, almost 90, 95% self-taught on clarinets. I've only had a few lessons in my life that were very pivotal and important, but I've mostly gone my own way. And that's the other reason I can do what I do is because I'm not trying to play traditional bass clarinet or even clarinet. And I've never played actual clarinet. I've, I've never owned a B-flat Barney Bagard clarinet. And the only time I've only recently started playing the E-flat piccolo top Bernino clarinet, which is much, much more an actual great clarinet that people think of. And the only reason that happened is because I got Giuseppe's horns when he passed, when Giuseppe Logan passed away, I got his horns and he had an E-flat piccolo and I was always curious about it. So that gave me the, a path to actually try it out. Very cool. Very cool. You know, for me, the bass clarinet has always been one of my favorite instruments. And uh, it's funny, if you go back to the Alistair Sim version of A Christmas Carol, whenever they bring up Jacob Marley, his motif is always on the bass clarinet. Yeah. Alpin on a uh, bitch's brew when I was like 13 or 14, where that dark, ominous sound. I play six string bass, and one of the main reasons I'm playing it is because, speaking of monk, Eric Dolphy's last date where he does epistrophe, and in the first 30 seconds, he's down from the lowest notes up to the highest notes, and it was just like, 
Wow. And that instrument really covers an awful lot of ground. Oh, man, the, the bass clarinet is so beautiful, man, because you think about where it started in jazz. For me, Harry Carney is where I go to first. It wasn't his main instrument, but on some of the ensemble stuff, like in the middle of Harlem Suite, you know, you get that big cavernous Harry Carney yeah. sound on bass clarinet. <laughs> but it wasn't his main axe. But then, of course, Eric. And I always looked at it like, I, I see Eric Duffy as like the Louis Armstrong of the of the bass clarinet. And then I say, okay, I'm looking at it like that. And I'm saying to myself, what a place to begin. <laughs> like you just saying, like going from the bottom to the top, Eric's impossible technique and everything that he did. If an instrument is going to start there, where do we go from here? And then he's he's kind of like Miles Davis too. Like if you play if you play bass clarinet, how do you not play like Eric? And besides the the beautiful sound, it, it's very conducive to wide intervals. And, right. Uh, but the other thing about Dolphy was he never really played in tune. He had you know he'd, he'd been he'd been out uh, practicing with the birds in L.A. So his tuning was closer to an, almost like a just intonation, whatever the scale he was working off. So it made it even more exotic, the way he played. It, it, actually, all of his instruments. Was... Yeah, it was that experience. Then I playing the bass clarinet for a while. I was still thinking, OK, what else hasn't anybody done? And that's when I really drilled down on the alto clarinet, because I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Nobody is doing this. And you think I don't think Eric, anyone knows about the alto clarinet. You know what I mean? <laughs> the alto clarinet has has been, I call it the abandoned sound. It's been cast aside. It's like some people call it the, the, the stepchild. Nobody wants to deal with it. The classical clarinet guys hate it because it's really hard to play correctly and properly like you do on clarinet. And But even jazz musicians are not doing it. So the way it happened was one of my, my longest term mentor was uh, S Sabir Mateen. He's a ten oh, I he's played a with him. He's wonderful. Sabir is a total master. And Sabir can absolutely destroy the alto clarinet it and and he I, I was in I was in three of his bands for more than 10 years. So I was seeing and hearing one of the only people to really deal with the instrument in person for a long, for a long time. And then I finally decided to cross that line myself. And it's almost been like a crusade to uh, try to legitimize the, the horn or put the horn on the map. I've done almost everything I can to make, besides doing like a straight album of standards, which I, I maybe I'll do that at some point, but I've really tried to almost prove that it should be included just like the bass clarinet. And, and it, should, it, it shouldn't be just this weird thing off to the side that no one does. I've done solo alto clarinet records. I've, I've recorded a lot with it. And I, I've done it for a long time, but in the end, I'm, I'm accepting in the end that it's still a weird sound that a lot of people are just not into. <laughs> and when you, and for whatever reason, I've never been able to hire a publicist, a publicist or anything like that. But whenever you have like a miscellaneous instrument pulled and downbeat or whatever, alto clarinet doesn't exist. It's always mm. cello. Cello usually wins. Cello is what, what a beautiful sound a cello is. But right. alto clarinet doesn't even make the, alto clarinet doesn't even, it's not considered, it's not considered a viable miscellaneous instrument <laughs> that we should all consider as, as part of the jazz canon or whatever. I don't know. Well, it looks like you found your calling, man. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty amazing, huh? A lot of great information. Matt did a great job and we will be doing a part two in just a couple of weeks because and we can't tell you who they are but over the next two weeks your minds are going to be blown and that's all we're going to say about it. That's it. We're blowing minds because that's what we do, David. We're mind blowers. So do listen to Notes from an Artist on our podcast, which you can get on Buzzsprout, Spotify, Amazon, Apple, and wherever podcasts are potted. Check out our YouTube page. We'll have some amazing new guests for you there. And go to www.notesfromanartist.com just if you have nothing uh, better to do. So great show with Matt, and we'll be back for part two. <music> 